My name is James Truckle, and I am an applications engineer uh, with Plexum. And I'm excited today to share some unique content about Plexum's latest offerings. Uh, we've done previous webinars that have examined uh, concepts of the Plex Coder, where we introduced major updates in 2019. Uh, last year in a webinar, we used the Plex Coder to generate code for a C2000 uh, launch pad that executed a field-oriented control algorithm for controlling a TI booster pack inverter and a brushless DC motor. In that webinar, developers answered questions about the motivations, implementations, and use cases for the Plex TI C2000 target support package. I encourage everyone to uh, watch this recording on our website uh, if you have any interest. Great, so today in this webinar, we will be exploring similar topics, but with a slightly different approach. Together, we will be going through the embedded software development process in Plex. Specifically, we will develop a current control model for an H-bridge converter that is enabled for TIC2000 MCU code generation. Plexum, in general, uh, designs tools to simplify the development process, particularly for power electronics engineers. This webinar demonstrates ease of use and model continuity features that enable engineers using Plexum's platform uh, to accelerate development cycles. Once we have successfully modeled and tested the power electronics system model in Plex, we will then use the Plex coder to generate target specific C code. And lastly, we will validate our generated code by running it on the microprocessor and testing it with a real power stage. Uh, since the focus today is on developing embedded controls for power electronics, uh, I may not comment on every detail within the Plex uh, plant model or the uh, hardware that I'm using. With that said, please feel free to ask any questions along the way, uh, and we will do our best to answer. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar uh, using the control window, and we'll answer them uh, at the end uh, or along the way uh, individually. You will receive uh, relevant links and some material in the follow-up emails. Uh, there are also some supporting document documents such as uh, the uh, C2000 user guide and also a description of the HBridge demo model uh, both available in the handout section of the, the GoToWebinar control window. Okay, so uh, during the webinar today, I will be working quite a bit with Plex and with the Plex coder. Uh, and to demonstrate the ease of use of this code generation process, uh, emphasis is being placed on building things step-by-step uh, -step from scratch. Do remember uh, that at the end, we will be using real hardware to validate our controls. So here is uh, an overview of my hardware. So we have uh, here a, a 24 volt a DC power supply. Uh, mounted on top of this, we have a TI C2000 launch pad. Uh, so this is that uh, red board underneath uh, this board, which is the TI Boost XL booster pack board. So this uh, booster pack directly interfaces to the launch pad uh, and then directs flow uh, of the current to an RL load um, via high side and low side switch connections. Uh, the launch pad itself is directly connected to my computer uh, over a USB cable um, for communicating to and from uh, the microprocessor. Great, so very quickly, uh, if you don't know much about Plexum, we are a Zurich-based engineering company. We develop tools for power electronic system designers. Uh, we are best known for our flagship software, Plex, uh, which is a complete power conversion system simulation package available in MATLAB Simulink or standalone. Uh, today, additional hardware and software tools that build upon the capabilities of Plex 
uh, now do give engineers uh, a uh, further capability of testing and developing uh, their power electronic systems. Uh, in the US, we have offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts and in Seattle, Washington, uh, where we support our customers in industry and uh, in academia. So uh, today in this webinar, we're going to be using Plex Standalone. Uh, the Plex Standalone tool has a complete controls library uh, to model control law. Uh, so with a, with a license uh, of the Plex coder and the necessary target support package files installed, uh, you can utilize a target support, uh, target support blocks for the C2000 MCUs. Um, a power electronics model of an H-bridge converter is also going to be shown today. This uses components from the electrical component library, which has uh, passive and, and active electrical components like resistors uh, and semiconductors. So uh, Plexum does have additional tools, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, support the the, uh, the testing of power electronics controllers. So these won't be talked about today, but I'm referencing uh, the Plex processor in the loop capability and also our uh, real-time simulator called the RT box, which can be leveraged uh, for hardware in the loop tests. Uh, so I'll briefly mention these uh, tools at the end and how they might fit into this workflow, uh, but there are uh, lots of other webinars and videos that do cover uh, these uh, tools. Great, so um, it's important for engineers developing power electronic systems to be able to model uh, complicated control behavior for their uh, custom applications. Uh, so similarly, it's very important that Plex accurately simulate uh, these control models um, that have a uh, complex behavior. So today you will see blocks from the Plex controls library, uh, which includes uh, discrete and continuous digital signal processing blocks uh, that we will use today to model a discrete PI controller. Uh, so our first simulation will actually demonstrate a model in the loop simulation approach where the PI controller model closes the loop in a Plex offline simulation. So there are additional capabilities that I won't show today, uh, but they are related to controls modeling and embedded controls in general. Uh, and I wanna quickly mention them. Uh, advanced components in Plex, Plex like a C-script block and even a DLL block can be used by engineers to get custom C code into Plex. And this can be useful for accurately uh, including the functionality of code that will later be used on a DSP in a Plex simulation. And these blocks themselves are uh, enabled for code generation as well. So. Uh, you can um, have these models in these these components in your model that you intend to uh, utilize with the Plex coder. So this approach uh, of having um, C code in your simulation is often described as a software in the loop simulation. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, quickly mention that. Uh, Plex also comes with a state machine block for event driven system design. Uh, which itself uh, provides uh, powerful capabilities. Um, so there are tutorials and webinars available on uh, these components online, uh, so please check them out if you're interested. Great, so uh, as I mention, uh, sorry, as I demonstrate uh, these uh, tools, so Plex and the Plex code generation workflow, there are some key uh, ease of use features that I'd encourage you to think about and consider how they compare to your current workflow. So building models in uh, Plex using the Plex library is a very straightforward process. Uh, the usability of Plex is reflected in its usefulness even at the undergraduate level when students start with uh, no exposure to circuit simulation uh, or have no knowledge of embedded controls and they can quickly find success uh, using Plex and the Plex coder. So these design principles uh, are very reflected in the Plex code generation process where users will experience uh, reduced complications with writing and debugging code. 
particularly in the early prototyping stage. One other thing to consider when evaluating a, a new engineering tool like this is to select a, a platform that can be leveraged from the, the start of a project, say at the, the circuit conceptual design stage, uh, all the way through uh, to its completion and during uh, sustaining engineering uh, practices. So here, the V model is used to share how you know, Plexum's tools align with this familiar development process. So when we start a design uh, using Plex, we really do have uh, one model that drives uh, the simulation, uh, the embedded control code development, and then also if you're using uh, the RT box for perhaps hardware in the loop testing, you can continue to use uh, the same model uh, for controller testing um, and systems integration. So uh, this model continuity, uh, a great um, uh, a feature of the Plex tool chain. Okay, so let's get started and I'll uh, start showing a, a bit of this workflow today. Uh, so I'm going to uh, show Plex now, uh, where we have our schematic here on the right and our library browser here on the left. Um, and here, uh, if I um, actually go up one level, here we have a, a skeleton base model that I'm going to use to uh, get started. So you can see this top level schematic, which contains a controller subsystem, which you just saw actually, and it's an empty subsystem at the moment, uh, because we're going to be building this up uh, today. We also have a model here of a power converter. Uh, so a couple quick things to point out at this top level. Notice that the controller subsystem has a darker outline. This indicates that this subsystem is enabled uh, for code generation, which we're going to be doing uh, uh, today once we've built up uh, a controller. So the circuit today is supplied by a 24-volt uh, uh, DC source. Uh, we have an H-bridge that's comprised of, uh, of a, uh, two IGBT uh, half-bridge uh, models. Um, uh, modules which are uh, found in, in uh, the Plex library. So these two uh, half bridge modules power our inductive load. Uh, and this model altogether really replicates a, a power stage that I have physically on my test bench. So having a plant modeled in Plex allows us to verify the control algorithms and the peripheral configurations of our MCU first using uh, an offline simulation. Once satisfied in simulation, we can proceed to testing actual control hardware and software when connected uh, to a real H-bridge converter. So in the model, uh, the DC input voltage and shunt current measurements we can see here are fed back to my controller uh, via this uh, sensing subsystem. And our goal here is to maintain 12 volts at the right leg of the H-bridge. So then we can vary uh, the left uh, leg voltage to regulate uh, the, the current through our inductor to a desired set point. So conceptually, this is what we're trying to do. Um, and just to quickly show you the sensing subsystem at the top of the schematic, uh, this this consists of scaling and offsets, which are utilized uh, for offline simulation. So because the plant model is based on a physical power circuit prototype, uh, the input voltage and shunt currents are scaled according to the voltage and current sense circuits of the TI booster pack hardware. To satisfy the voltage limits of the MCU ADCs, these values are scaled and offset to be within uh, 0 to 3.3 volts. So more details on these uh, voltage and current sensing circuits are actually described in the included handout uh, on the H-Bridge demo model. OK, great. So let's open our controller now, and we can, uh, we can get started here. So we can see that the model is currently empty and, and I'm going to start by introducing some blocks 
uh, from the TIC2000 target support package. So when you have the library installed, uh, you can find these blocks down here. And the blocks support modeling and programming MCU peripherals for sensing and actuation. Uh, today, we will be using uh, three of these blocks, and I can dr simply drag them uh, and drop them into the, the, the schematic uh, from the library like any other component in Plex. So first, the ADC for outputting measured voltages for analog input channels. Uh, next, we can take uh, the PWM, uh, which generates complementary PWM signal pairs. Uh, lastly, we can uh, grab a digital out, which we will also use today uh, to enable the PWM outputs. Our ADC today, as I mentioned, will be used to output the measured current from our sensing circuit and VDC. So I'll just rename this block uh, to reflect these measurement signals. Great, so um, if I quickly show you the top level schematic, uh, you can see here um, that the uh, IO blocks that we dragged into the controller automatically create input and output ports for the subsystem here. So we can actually use these now, uh, these ports and connect them uh, to my plant model uh, at the top level of my schematic for offline simulation. And if I go back to my controller and I right click these components, I can actually see uh, a key feature to why these components are enabled for offline simulation. So the behavior of this ADC uh, is replicated in this schematic during an offline simulation. So we're able to verify the behavior of the ADC um, by running an offline simulation, and we can uh, verify the schematic implementation uh, of this behavior ourselves by uh, looking under the mask of the component, which I'm doing now. Okay, super. So, um, so now I need to configure uh, a few options, a few basic parameters within my PWM block. Uh, simple parameterization is a key characteristic of the Plex coder uh, and the C2000 support package in general. Uh, so using this block, important parameters such as the PWM generators, uh, the carrier type, um, the carrier frequency, uh, any blanking time, these can all be easily defined here and also inspected. So it removes the often demanding task of understanding processor specific registers, um, register values, and also combing through uh, you know, pages and pages within a user manual. Uh, so for our application, these default parameters are switching frequency of 10 kilohertz, a symmetrical carrier, uh, some small uh, amount of blanking time. These are all fine. I do need to uh, make a, a, a quick adjustment here of the PWMs, and I'll use uh, PWM generators four and five uh, for this application. So, um, in the events tab here, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, click this events tab. Uh, here uh, we can see uh, the block parameter uh, 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 the block parameters where window where users have access to uh, trigger configuration options. Uh, so here. Uh, we will configure the ADC trigger parameter uh, as overflow. So what this means is that the first EPWM module associated with this block uh, generates a start of conversion signal for the ADCs whenever the carrier value reaches its maximum. So back in my main, you can see that the polarity here is configured to one, uh, which means that the low side switch if I just go back to my uh, plant model, the low side switches will be closed when the PWM is high. Uh, so so uh, with the ADC triggered here at the overflow, um, we can um, uh, measure the shunt current only when the, the switch, uh, the low side switch is closed and therefore there's current flowing through it. 
So notice as I click this apply, uh, watch the PWM peripheral uh, component. As I click apply, uh, we now get um, the ADC port uh, to, uh, to configure uh, uh, this triggering. Great, so uh, I'll click OK. So the uh, in this model, the the interrupt sequence of the embedded application is defined explicitly uh, by connecting trigger signals between our PWM generator and the ADC. So the trigger signal uh, is shown here as a red dashed line, uh, and then actually within my ADC. I can configure other uh, uh, control, uh, uh, trigger options, such as for the control task. Um, so let's open this block parameters now. Great, so the measurements for the input voltage and the inductor current are introduced to the model environment from this ADC block, uh, again, from our TIC2000 target support library. So the scaling uh, and offset factors are provided to each channel uh, um, via this uh, these block parameters. So uh, in order to convert the detected analog voltage into values with physical units, um, you know, for the control algorithm, we're utilizing this ADC. So the ADC unit um, and channels are also configured here. Um, and for our application, uh, using the launch pad and the booster pack, I need to configure uh, three channels here, which I know to be uh, 3, 11, and 15. Again, these are based off of uh, the configuration of the launch pad and the booster pack. So the scaling and offsets are, again, they're based off of the current shunt amplifier circuit. Uh, to satisfy the limits of our TI microcontroller. So I actually previously initialized variables for these parameters uh, within a parameter initialization. Uh, so I called them ADC scale and ADC offset. Great. Um, so one more thing here, uh, we will change this trigger source parameter of the ADC block to show trigger port. Uh, and this allows the trigger source for the ADC to be uh, the PWM block as previously discussed. So notice the ADC block, as I click apply, we get a new uh, trigger port, which we can connect uh, to the signal here. Okay. Just to clean things up, we can reconnect this signal. Great. Okay, so um, there are three signals coming out of my ADC, which I need to uh, 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 connect to a, a demultiplexer component, which I can do like this, so I can individually access my three uh, measurements. I noticed here that I forgot to connect uh, my control task trigger. So this is an important section uh, where we have this control task trigger block, uh, again, in the C2000 library. Um, and by connecting this to the task port of the ADC, I'm configuring the control task to execute after the last conversion on the ADC module. Uh, okay, so uh, these signals coming out of my ADC, uh, I can demultiplex to access individually in the schematic. Uh, and I actually will use um, a, uh, a signal go to block uh, to tag my DC voltage, which will be used uh, at several points uh, during the during the um, during the model development here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we're going to supply to our PWM here. So we'll supply two duty cycles to the PWM for the right leg and the left leg of the H-bridge. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be biasing the right leg duty cycle in order to maintain 12 volts at the right leg H-bridge output. So I can easily create logic for this by, by using a few blocks from the controls library. So first uh, I'll use 
a, a constant block here uh, so that we can command uh, our 12 volts. Um, and I'll just add a label here so we know uh, that this is the 12 volt bias uh, right leg duty cycle. Great. Um, so I need to provide two duty cycles, as I mentioned, to the PWM block. So this will require uh, vectorizing the signals using a, a signal multiplexer. Uh, and we'll be going from two inputs uh, to one here. Um, no, actually not yet. So there's our first right leg duty cycle. Uh, in order to create uh, the uh, uh, duty cycle, um, we need to uh, divide this um, by the DC source voltage. So we need to divide our desired voltage with the DC source. So I can find a divide block. Again, leveraging uh, now the search functionality of uh, the library browser. And we can connect this and connect this to our output to our PWM. Uh, now I do need a signal from here where I can again tag now the VDC to limit the uh, the complexity of wires going to and from different components. Um, great, so now uh, we can get to work on building some logic for the left leg duty cycle calculation. So I'm going to do this in a few steps. Uh, first, I'll drag some components uh, into my schematic. Uh, I'll give them some parameters, and, and finally, we can connect them together. Uh, to regulate the current to a desired uh, set point, we will be using today a discrete PI controller, which first requires calculating the error for current compensation. Uh, so we can start uh, by adding a pulse generator block, which will be used to generate my oscillating current uh, so I'll oscillate the set point between, say, plus 3 and minus 3 amps uh, at a frequency of 100 hertz, and our 50% duty cycle uh, will be just fine for, for today's demonstration. Um, great. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to create the error signal. Uh, so we'll need to utilize the subtract uh, math component, uh, and we can then find our... our uh, our sense current uh, down here at the output of my ADC. Great, so next, uh, in order to continue modeling the PI controller, I need uh, two gain blocks representing the proportional and integral gains uh, of the controller. So I'm just gonna utilize uh, some copy uh, shortcuts within Plex um, uh, to do this. So I'll just add a quick label here saying that this is our error signal. Uh, and now to continue uh, developing this control model, um, I need to build my discrete implement, uh, discrete integrator. Uh, so I'm gonna use a very simple implementation today. Uh, there's multiple ways we could model this. Uh, today we're gonna use uh, simply a saturation block, a delay block, and a sum block. Okay, so great. So these uh, components uh, now uh, implement our, our discrete integrator. They also implement for us a, a very basic anti-windup. Great, so we can connect these together. I will need an additional sum block here to uh, bring together the uh, proportional and integrator sections of my controller. Uh, great. So um, I'll just uh, note that this is a, a fully discretized model, uh, which is fully compatible uh, with the Plex uh, code generation process. Uh, so now we can parameterize these blocks, uh, and, and I'll start by uh, parameterizing our gains. Um, so these uh, continuous control parameters of the PI controller, uh, KP and KI, uh, are first calculated uh, using the magnitude optimum criterion. 
Uh, then a discrete implementation, uh, KPZ and KIZ are calculated by applying a Tustin transformation. So there is some more information on these calculations available in the attached handout. I'm not going to review uh, the math today in this webinar, uh, but you do have this information to you uh, available. And uh, our uh, uh, gain here will be one, and I can just uh, show that. I can relabel this uh, KPZ IZ. And our gain here on the integrator will be uh, 0.33. Again, uh, relabel this KIZ. Great. So in order uh, to now complete these parameterizations, I can parameterize my saturation, where we need to set some integrator limits. Uh, these should be uh, plus VDC over 2 to minus VDC over 2. So 12 volts to minus 12 volts. And this, uh, these are set in this way since this is essentially the maximum and minimum uh, effective voltage that the system can realize. Okay, so we can show these parameters. Uh, now our delay block, we need to here specify a sampling time or a control period, which in our case today is uh, going to be one over our switching frequency or 1e to the negative 4. So this resultant signal coming out of our sum block is representative of our uh, voltage set point. Uh, and before I can connect this uh, voltage set point uh, to my uh, uh, duty cycle calculation, uh, I do need to um, account for this 12 volt bias that's applied uh, from the beginning of the uh, uh, of the power supply startup um, to uh, the right leg of the H bridge. So currently this left leg will initialize at a zero duty cycle, and this will then result in a high negative current. So to fix this, uh, we can apply the 12 volts uh, from the right leg uh, from the beginning uh, to our, our left leg. Uh, great. So um, our model is almost done. The only thing I have left here to configure is my uh, my digital out block, which is uh, the enable PWM signal. Uh, so I'm going to use a constant block uh, to send this enable command. So we'll first set this to be zero, and then uh, we'll later um, change this to one, thus enabling uh, the PWMs. So now that we do have a full system modeled, uh, we can run a simulation in Plex to make sure that the waveforms look good offline before programming the, the C2000 MCU and testing the control uh, with real hardware. Uh, so this, again, this offline simulation ensures Things like uh, the correct ADC scaling and offset values are selected, uh, that our control parameters here are correct, uh, that the PWM uh, and trigger sensing, uh, triggers, excuse me, triggers uh, are configured properly. Um, and again, we can do this uh, offline simulation because the behavior of our peripherals are represented here in the schematic. And remember, uh, that we do have uh, this offline uh, plant model uh, um, ready here at the top level of our schematic. So just wanted to uh, reflash that so you understand uh, kind of the complete simulation here. So uh, now before I run the simulation, I need to, to get in a, a, a scope here so I can monitor some signals. Um, so I'm going to need uh, three channels on my scope here. So I'm going to insert some new plots, and then you'll notice uh, new uh, ports open up for my scope. Uh, and the uh, first signal that I'd like to monitor is my is my uh, inductor current. Um, and I'm going to do a, a quick configuration here, uh, where I can I can see both my uh, commanded uh, current set point and my uh, my measured uh, current set point by just um, 
sorry, my excuse me, my measured current uh, just by uh, vectorizing these signals together, uh, taking a signal go to block, and we'll label this IL, apply it, and now actually I'll just copy what's already in my schematic here. So I'll find that IL tag name, and I can connect this then to the top channel of the scope. I'll actually monitor the VDC uh, on the bottom channel of my scope. And for the middle channel, uh, we can observe uh, the modulation index. Um, and now we can, uh, we can run a simulation. So let me open the scope, uh, run a quick shortcut uh, by using Command T to start the simulation. Um, and now we can see these resulting waveforms. Um, and we can see that the, the, the discrete PI controller uh, does its job by regulating uh, the inductor current uh, output to, to three amps and minus three amps. So what I'll do here is I'll save uh, this trace as offline uh, model in the loop simulation. Great, so at this point, uh, we could uh, conceptually uh, uh, say that the design is, is, you know, we could say that the design is conceptually uh, valid because it works uh, in, a, in a Plex simulation. So now uh, we will fully test the system by programming a, a TIC2000 um, using the Plex coder. So let me just quickly turn on my webcam uh, so you can see the hardware in front of me. Great, so uh, so you can see here, I have my hardware set up. Uh, you can see the RL load here. You can see the launch pad. You can see uh, the booster pack board uh, and also my power supply. You can also see here uh, a serial communication back to my PC uh, for programming, or excuse me, my Mac in this case for programming. Great, so, uh, so let's get started now. I'm gonna turn off the webcam. Uh, I just did that to, to prove that we're dealing with live uh, hardware today. Uh, so I'll turn that off. So in my lab, I might of course have kind of an oscilloscope and some data acquisition set up uh, here to capture the data from this test. Um, uh, but today we'll, we'll actually use a, a different method for viewing waveforms. Uh, so if you have a, a, an active license of the coder, you can uh, get access to the coder options window uh, from uh, the coder menu in the Plex toolbar. So here is that uh, window, um, and you can see several tabs here for configuring the code generation settings. So in this first tab, uh, the general tab, I'd really only highlight here um, the discretization step size, which in this case is our controller sample size that we've been using um, at other places in the demo. So this is uh, again, one over the switching frequency, which we've defined here as 10 kilohertz. So one E uh, to the negative four. Uh, our next tab here uh, is the parameter uh, inlining tab. And this allows users to specify components in the code uh, that will be tunable and that you can adjust uh, during a real-time operation of the embedded target. So to demonstrate this, uh, I will do, uh, I will inline a, a couple of components here. So the pulse generator, so we can adjust uh, our current set point and also our enable command uh, so we can uh, enable our PWMs. Um, Great, so the uh, third tab here is the target tab, um, and we can uh, use this to specify which target that we want to program uh, here in the, in the drop-down menu. So you can see that the TIC2000 family is supported, uh, and the Plex RT Box 1 is also supported. So this coder tool would also be used to discretize uh, plant models or uh, power electronic circuit models uh, for executing hardware in the loop tests. Um, we can also choose to generate generic C code um, 
if perhaps you're interested in, in uh, uh, automating the coding process for other D DSPs and you'd like to develop your own target support package, uh, you can kind of leverage uh, this capability as well. Uh, or you can reach out to our team to discuss custom engineering projects. Uh, we are certainly developing uh, this capability for other targets, uh, but please reach out to us if you do have uh, specific requests. So the only other setting here that I would highlight is this uh, build type setting. Um, and currently we have build and program selected. So users can choose to either uh, build and program the target directly, um, which we'll do today, or they can choose to generate this code into a Code Composer Studio project to inspect the code uh, and make any changes. Great, so I will uh, now click uh, the build button and we can, uh, we can see what happens here. So um, this process, the build process typically takes, you know, uh, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. Um, and once we're running, once we've flashed the MCU, uh, we can enter external mode. So that uh, uh, flashed uh, and we're now um, running. Uh, and now I can use the external mode tab to uh, connect to the device. So first we need to specify uh, how we're connecting and I'm gonna connect over serial and I'll select the appropriate uh, channel here. Uh, okay, and then I click the connect. Uh, and this essentially is activating um, all of the scopes in the model to become a real-time soft scopes. So um, if I activate the trigger, uh, we can go into the scope and we, uh, we'll start to see waveforms. Uh, what we're not seeing yet is uh, uh, our PWMs coming on. So let me enable our PWMs and, and then go back to the scope. And now what we see, it's a bit difficult because we're overlaying our offline trace. But if I just turn that offline trace um, and I go in, oh, oh, you know what I did here? I forgot to uh, set my digital output uh, to the enable signal. So let me just reconnect here or disconnect rather. I do need to make a quick adjustment. This is GPIO 52 and I will re-generate uh, that code, uh, which should just uh, be a quick fix here. Okay, so we built, uh, we can connect to external mode again, uh, and we should see uh, our, once I activate uh, our trigger here, we should see our nicely regulated currents. Uh, so the, uh, sorry about that. The PWMs uh, are now uh, obviously generating signals and we are uh, regulating our, our current uh, as, uh, as intended. So you can see the current set point here at three amps uh, and we're nicely following that uh, uh, when we're getting the output from our ADC here. Uh, we can see the modulation index here, our uh, right side um, of the H-bridge uh, biased at 12 volts with the 50% duty cycle. Um, and down here we can see uh, the measured uh, VDC. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, what we're seeing now is pretty good. Uh, you know, we could say that uh, everything is not uh, working as intended. We can also turn on uh, the trace for that offline simulation, and we can see that it even matches uh, these results quite nicely as well. So this is that kind of uh, model continuity workflow uh, that I uh, keep mentioning. So one other thing that I might uh, quickly show is just adjusting um, our current set point here. So if I go into the pulse generator, and I'll, I'll actually uh, keep the scope up so you can see this. And if I adjust then my set point to one and minus one and I click apply, we should see uh, that the converter, uh, uh, that the inductor current is now one and minus one. 
Great, and now we see that reflected uh, in our incoming uh, measurement signals. Great, so now uh, is kind of a good time to think of some questions. Uh, this ability to interact with the model uh, kind of gives the user uh, some, some additional testing options. You may also do some control parameter tuning. We could inline the gains, for example, um, you know, perhaps in another demo. Uh, but yeah, so now is a great time to think of some questions if you have them. Uh, I'll just quickly go back to a, a slide here. Um, and you can kind of see here in this slide uh, that there's a variety of workflows that can be used for uh, you know, when utilizing the Plex toolchain. So today we demonstrated this kind of power code gen approach where I showed how you can use Plex and the Plex coder to run offline simulations of a power electronic system, uh, and then subsequently generate the code for an MCU uh, and test that code uh, with a, a real power stage. Um, so what we didn't talk about was kind of other approaches where you might choose to first uh, validate uh, your generated code with the RT box. So you'd leverage kind of this Hill code gen workflow where instead of uh, uh, sim, um, uh, testing the code with the actual power stage, we might first do a, a test and a verification uh, with a, a real-time simulator like the RT box. Um, so there's a variety of workflows that you can use, and you know we'd be happy to discuss uh, what's best suited for your prototyping, development, and research. Uh, so just um, reach out to us if you do have any uh, additional um, comments or would like to see kind of these other workflows. Um, I do hope everyone has the chance to try this on their own. We do have licenses uh, available on a evaluation basis, so trial licenses can be requested online, um, and all of the necessary downloads that we discussed are there as well.